again, and welcome to another episode of Friends, Facts, and Fiction. As always, this podcast is made possible by our local convenience stores, the misappropriation of history, and you. And now to your hosts, Justin Hammonds, Brant Bramlett, and Drew Shellnut. What's up? What's happening, world? It's a podcast called Friends. Facts and Fiction, Season 5, Trying to Thrive and Stay Alive. Mm. Yeah. Okay, okay. Episode 13. It's a little art heist. You know what I'm saying? A little Ocean's Loud. A little bitty one. A little EO11. A little tiny <laughs> one. Yeah. If you know the OG Ocean's Eleven with, with the Rat Pack, you'll get that reference. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. But anyway. Um, yeah, I like that one because they didn't actually get away with it. Bro, yeah. I like, well, they did, but what, they didn't get it. They didn't I, get I the, like that one because they filmed that in a time where, like, how the fuck did you film that? You know that's what I mean? true. Like, yeah. yeah, no, <laughs> it's, it's a great real, classic bro. movie. Yeah, yeah, it's so. fucking dope. The little scene with the garbage trucks and shit is like, mm-hmm. bro, mm-hmm. that's a legit stopping real traffic. Mm-hmm. Like, you don't have a set. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, no. you're out here in like the yeah. shits, like mm-hmm. for real. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, man, we back with these hot facts. You know what I'm saying. I'm Justin Hammonds, looking at my boy Drew Shonut. Yes, you are. And my boy Grant Bramley. Hello. And uh, yeah, we're talking about a little art heist today. Um, <laughs> this wild, crazy, just madness. Uh, if you're privy to the greatest art heist in history, there's a documentary on Netflix about it. But we're going to give you some funnies and some facts about it today. But how's everybody doing? Everybody good? Yeah. yeah. yeah still good. hot, still tired. Yeah, nothing changed. Still, still, still peeing yellow. <laughs> yep. Well, there you go, man. You do what you gotta do, you know. It'd be um, cool if I figured out how to actually hydrate right now, but you know that is what it is. Get you this bio light up in your system, bro. I don't think you understand. I'm yeah. drinking like twelve of those, the equivalent yeah. of like twelve of those hey, a day. Hey, <laughs> I need to go to IV. You get your IV. Yeah, account. No, that's true. Actually. Or you just have one like while you're on the yeah, floor. Uh, get you a portable <laughs> yeah. pack just like on the on the joint. Yeah, just tie the little IV bag stand to the back <laughs> of the mower. Exactly. <laughs> Are you okay, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm good <laughs> now. I'm great, actually. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Better than you. <laughs> Yeah, if, if, Go uh, back inside. It's hot out here. Yeah, yeah. But if anything, <laughs> for like everybody out there, stay hydrated, man. It's hot. Like it's like it's hot mm-hmm. across the world. <laughs> like isn't that like a every section and it is no it's 100 degrees in oklahoma like every day it feels yeah. like nine days yeah when i was in montana it was like fucking 98 damn degrees in montana uk is on fire you know what i mean like, yeah i just saw uh there's wildfires 10, across the world 108 like, for washington state that's crazy bro. in a couple of days up in like pacific, pacific northwest yes they're like, gonna like, die. super pacific northwest yeah that's real bro i think it's yakima they're not gonna know what's gonna happen i don't no. think they have anything other than patagonia out there bro mm-hmm. no <laughs> no they have t-shirts and shit out there <laughs> But, uh, <laughs> right. but uh, you know, drop the top on a Subaru, you feel me? But <laughs> <laughs> see people out there with chainsaws. <laughs> <laughs> Subaru uh, nation up there, bro. <laughs> Swear to God, when I was in Montana, bro, it was like every other, like every other car here is like a truck or a sports car. Mm-hmm. It's like every other car that was a Subaru or a Subaru. Or a, or a Bronco, work truck, right? <laughs> or or a work. Bronco. Yeah. Yeah, fucking Broncos are like crazy. And I'm like, I just start shooting fingers at them. Like, <laughs> fuck you for living your best life, <laughs> motherfucker. <laughs> you know what I mean? I want a Bronco really badly. But anyway, um, yeah, man. Um, we're back, like I said, with, the, with these facts and shit. Hope y'all doing good out there. Stay hydrated. Um, you know, take some time off if you can. Holidays are coming. Mm-hmm. You know, don't, don't forget. Usa. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, we've covered that. That is a good <laughs> idea to start thinking about fucking Christmas now. Yeah, I guess. I'm telling you, bro, it, it comes quicker than you know. And it's always around July, August. You're like, oh, it's the past few months. Yeah, we got six months. It's right, fine. Right, it's fine. It's like, no, bro, you got like six weeks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like legit. Until it's like, oh, shit, it's Halloween. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, fuck. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, anyway, keep your head on a swivel, man. But, um, you got a song of the day of the week, my dude? I do, actually. Uh, when I went out to Erie, Pennsylvania for our buddy's wedding, Kevin, that was on the episode. Yeah, the music theory episode. Mm-hmm. Right? Music therapy episode. Music therapy episode. Yeah. One of the tunes that we covered at uh, his rehearsal dinner was a song off of the album Ram by Paul McCartney. Oh, right. And I, it reminded me that that's probably my favorite uh, album that he's released Solo, Solo, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. It is just, every single song is absolutely gorgeous. Um, oh, fuck but yeah. I wanted to call out my favorite tune on that album, which is Uncle Albert, Admiral Halsey, Medley. 
as it's called, as it's entitled. That's the Paul McCartney mm. title if I ever it heard. It really one. is Jesus because I absolutely love it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's got like the the British uh, dial tone in the middle of it mm-hmm. to like switch over the two like mel- medleys, you know, or between one song to the other song in the medley itself or whatever. Yeah, but just that little that he yeah, does. Mm-hmm. It's like Paul McCartney shit. Yeah, <laughs> I just love it. I don't know. It's, well, I'll never. It's forget beautiful it. and it makes you happy. Yeah. Makes you smile. Makes you dance. Makes you ponder. Bro, he mm. he figured something out, you know, because he was basically the mastermind. He figured something out. With he the, sure with those did. Boys. I never forget when uh, he did a song with Kanye like years ago, and all the young cats were like, "Who's this white dude, bro?" Yeah. And I'm like, "But who's the black dude, dude? Like, what the <laughs> right? fuck, the fuck are you talking about? It's fucking Paul McCartney, you fucking yeah. jackass! Like, uh, no. what the shit? Like, when Missy Elliott did the Super Bowl halftime show. Like, That's what who was this? I'm like, who was the old guy playing bitch? piano? He was pretty cool. It's like, <laughs> okay, walk away from me right now. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes, please. Like, bro, like, Jesus Christ. Um, but yeah, that's what's up. Check that song out. Um, Mr. What did you just say? What's the name of oh, it? Man, I got to look it up again. It's, it's recorded. <laughs> Uncle Albert uh, Admiral Halsey Medley. Ah, it was the check, full title. Hey, of it. check that joint. But it's out. on Ram. Just listen to the whole damn album. And then you'll hear the part of that song. You'll be like, oh, that's hey, one, Grant. And, mm-hmm. and, and there you go. <laughs> and there you go. The root the doot doo joint. You know what I mean? <laughs> Turn up. Yeah. But, um, yeah, we get to these hot facts, man. Uh, you know, get relaxed. You know what I'm saying? Or, or, you know, get aware if you're driving. Get relaxed if you're chilling. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Take a sip, take a drag, whatever you're doing. All right, let's do it. Cool. I uh, just wanted to say real quick, obviously, Justin already mentioned it in the intro that, you know, Netflix does have a docuseries on it. That's what, you know, um, put it on my radar. I was like, this shit is fucking bonkers. They did a great job. But I did find some extra shit and a little article that kind of pseudo reviews it or whatever. But mm-hmm. what's incredibly neat to me is that it's still ongoing. Yeah. So it's I'm going to end this podcast found, to, to just a few months ago. It's a complete mystery. And we're going to be starting on April 14th, 1840. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. A woman by the name of Isabella Stewart Gardner was born to a wealthy linen merchant and his wife in Boston, Massachusetts. By growing up, she was constantly exposed to the finer things in life. You know, fine art, music, that fancy kind, though. You know what I mean? <laughs> and dance, also the fancy kind of dance. You know, with all, like, the tippy-toe people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, about yeah. ballroom? Mm-hmm. No, no, ballet is what I'm talking about. There, oh, right? ballet. <laughs> oh, oh, ballet. Then she attended an American school in Paris and traveled around Europe, falling in love with the worlds of the Italian, I'm sorry, the works of the Italian Renaissance. She returned to New York in 1858 and then settled back home to Boston shortly after that. In 1860, Isabella married one of Boston's most eligible bachelors, John Lowell Gardner Jr. The couple had one son who died from pneumonia at just two years old. In 1866, Gardner suffered a miscarriage and was told by doctors that she would never be able to bear children. Wow. Heartbroken, uh, Gardner withdrew from society and became increasingly ill. Her doctors suggested that a trip to Europe could improve her health. What? So Isabella and There's Jack air out there. Yeah, air. Sure. And Jack <laughs> boarded a ship to Paris. Boom. By the way, it must be fucking nice. I mean, yeah. Jesus. Oh, I, I mean, but, I feel terrible for her. That sucks, but like, yeah. no, bro. This sounds, this sounds like <laughs> this sounds like an Instagram model this day and age. Like, yeah, oh right? yeah, I'm in Paris, back to New York. Yeah. Oh, yeah. wish I was back. Take me back. <laughs> yeah. So, but, but this bitch is on ships, by the way. Like, this ain't no quick trip. <laughs> no, no it's like a fucking week on the sea. Yeah. Like, yeah. that's crazy. Anyway. But Paris apparently had a profound influence on Isabella's health, and as her mood began to improve, she eagerly returned home to Boston to establish herself as a fashionable socialite. Following the death of her father in 1891, Gardner used her inheritance to begin her fine art collection. One of her first acquisitions was Vermeer's The Concert, which is uh, one of the most valuable paintings like to this day. I think it's like $250 million or something like Jeez. that. Turn up. Uh-huh. Gardner traveled to Venice, Paris, and throughout Asia and the Middle East, searching for more works to add to her impressive collection. In all, the Gardner collection contained 70 pieces of fine art Mm. by some of Europe's most renowned artists. So she just went to Europe and was like, hey, appreciate y'all culture. I'm going to take this with me. A little bit of a shopping spree. I'm going to take this with me, Mm -hmm. though. All right. Mm -hmm. With priceless works like Botticelli's Madonna and Child with an Angel or Rembrandt's Self-Portrait at age 23 and uh, Titan's Rape of Europa. 
mm. which is an insanely valuable piece. Soon the gardeners' collection had outgrown their home in Boston's Back Bay. Following the death of her husband in 1898, Isabella decided to pursue her dream of opening a museum to host her collection, quote, for the education and enjoyment of the public forever. <laughs> forever, ever. Now, this stunning museum building is inspired by a 15th century Venetian palace. It includes a garden courtyard surrounded by glass, three floors of gallery space basically surrounding that. So you walk in this huge open Venetian garden, and like with live plants, like tall, yeah. tall yeah, fucking bro. trees and just this massive skylight. It's like and an then just indoor room, arboretum. You know, rooms yeah. around that and then the upstairs rooms around that, rooms around that upstairs, all four floors. That's it's crazy. It's fucking insane. I actually really, really want to go. That Rainforest Cafe, bro. Um, <laughs> so it's three floors of gallery space and a music room, all carefully designed to display Garner's collection in her own eclectic way. It doesn't feel like a fine art museum. Yeah. It feels like this really badass building with a bunch of cool shit in it. Mm -hmm. And then you walk up, like, oh, that's a nice piece. And you go, oh my God, that's a fucking Rembrandt. You know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> now, the museum opened on January 1st, 1903, and still operates according to Isabella's grand vision, long after her death in 1924. But by the 1980s, the museum was running low on funds. The financial strain left the museum in poor condition. It lacked a climate control system and an insurance policy, oh, wow. what? which is going to be a big deal a little bit later, and was in need of basic building maintenance. Dude, at one point, a second-story sewage line broke and leaked into a first-floor gallery. Oh, no. Damn. Apparently, all the art was unharmed, but could you fucking imagine just shit water? Like, no, around man. a $100 million painting? Mm -hmm. Apparently, it, the, because of the climate control issue, the garden courtyard would sometimes... Um, accumulate so much moisture during storms that indoor rain clouds would Whoa. form and they would actually rain. It would, inside rain would happen sometimes. That's fucking wild. And just on a regularly humid day, which it's Boston, it's a Bay Area, yeah. of course it's common, yeah. you could actually see some of these paintings sweat. Oh, no. Like That's so water bad. and a four, five, six hundred Man. year old painting. They those, don't go together uh, uh, very well. Those, 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 those snobby, snobby art people are having a heart attack right now. <laughs> I mean, seriously, man. <laughs> Crazy. Uh, so, you know, obviously it's not in the best of shape. Mm -hmm. Now, to make matters worse, the FBI uncovered a plot by Boston criminal, criminals to rob the museum in 1982, forcing the museum to allocate funds to improve security. Among these improvements were 60 infrared motion detectors, and a closed circuit television system consisting of only four cameras placed oh, around nice. the building's perimeter, the exterior perimeter. Oh, mm. and oh, right. Four, and that's so, it. So blind spots heard. Yeah. Ah, a couple. Yeah, a couple. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> just a few. Uh, now, there were no cameras installed inside because the Board of Trustees thought installing such equipment in this historical building would be too expensive. That's stupid. It does sound stupid. Especially to us in retrospect. But mm -hmm. you have to imagine running electricity and hardwired lines for the system was probably an atrocious amount at the time. Also, in the 80s, yes, yeah, just by expensive. In the shit. 1980s, and this building was built in the 1890s. Like, I can see where they're coming from. Be and a then bunch also, of exposed on top wire of it, and big ass cameras. Um, basically. <laughs> her big thing was to not disturb or change her museum in any way. And she actually put in her will that if it was changed too much, and that and too much was to be decided by the board of trustees, that she would donate its entirety to Yale. Oh, wow. I'm sorry, Harvard, because I was in yeah. Boston. Yeah, yeah, Harvard. I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't actually write that down. I just remembered it. Um, <laughs> She was. She would just well, donate all of it to Harvard, so they were like really worried mm -hmm. about like what's the line mm -hmm. to cross here. Yeah, yeah. So is it security cameras inside? <laughs> Maybe you know. <laughs> also, also, the rich just staying rich. Just give that to Harvard. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah. I know. It is. Yeah. And <laughs> also on top of it, there's another thing I was listening to earlier today. Apparently, the board of trustees were like the wealth like members of the wealthiest families in Boston mm. and they thought hosting um like charitable events were seen as like gauche or begging because every other museum ever 
has at yeah. least an annual massive charitable organization in yeah, which bro. rich people just Here. throw mm-hmm. tons mm-hmm. of cash Come drink at them some real good to wine. keep art alive, right? Yeah. I mean, that's just drink the epitome of... Yeah. Act like you know what the fuck art you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and then <laughs> I mean, write them a check for $15,000 exactly. and Pretend say you know that you did artists. something good for the community, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. That's normal, but not yeah. here. Like, they just refuse to do it. But at least more security guards were hired. Which I'll talk about that a little later. But despite these minor security improvements, the only way police could be summoned to the museum was with one single button at the front security desk. Oh, hell yeah, bro. Right. Big vibes. Did other uh, And other museums at the time had this fail-safe system which required not, white, Jesus, night watchmen to make hourly phone calls to the police to indicate that all is well. That's right? a check-in. A fair Nine word. o'clock. Good all as well. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So uh, an independent security consultant reviewed the museum's operation in 1988 and determined that they were on par with most other museums, but recommended more improvements. The security director at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston also suggested security upgrades to the museum. It's not even his name, museum, and he's like, hey, seriously, you guys need to get your shit together. <laughs> <laughs> Bro. But because of the museum's financial strain and her wishes against any major, uh, Stuart Gardner's wishes against any major innovations, like I mentioned earlier, the board did not approve any more security enhancements. They also denied a request from the security director for higher guard salaries in a bid to attract more qualified applicants for the job. Mm. The current guards were paid slightly above minimum wage. Mm. That's fun. And the security flaws of the museum were not were a open secret amongst all the guards. So you got a bunch of kids, basically. Underpaid or kids. Or burnouts or mm-hmm. people that don't give a fuck about anything else mm-hmm. because they're just going to do something easy for a little bit of money to get by. Mm-hmm. You basically just so, sit there. Exactly, yeah. But, mm-hmm. I mean, imagine them drinking a little too much at a bar one night and loudly talking about how garbage the security is at this amazing oh, yeah, right? art museum. At this hundreds of millions of dollars, yeah. basically open vault right. to the world. Yeah. Craziness. Yeah. So, it's fucking well. the robbery <laughs> that was inevitable <laughs> occurred in the early hours of Sunday, March 18th, 1990. Well, let's go must follow me. <coughs> Excuse me. The thieves were first witnessed around 12.30 a.m., by several St. Patrick's Day revelers leaving a party near the museum. By the way, St. Patrick's Day, Boston, yeah, genius time yep. to oh, pull off really a big is. ass job. Yeah, bro. I mean, come on, <laughs> twelve thirty a.m. Every Boston, cop St. in Patty's the city Day? is distracted mm-hmm. or drunk, and mm-hmm. every citizen of that city is very drunk. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking genius. Mm-hmm. Two men. Uh, were disguised as disguised as police officers and parked in a little shitty, uh, like gray blue hatchback on Palace Road, about a hundred feet from the side entrance. The witnesses believed them to be policemen, even though they were in not a cop car mm-hmm. and they were fully uniformed. And and they're <laughs> in a hatchback. Those don't line up. Mm-hmm. You know? yeah. I mean, I've seen cops in some weird cars, but never yeah. seen them in a hatchback, mm-hmm. bro. Yeah. <laughs> Now, the museum <laughs> guards on duty that night were a Rick Abath, age 23, and Randy Hestan, age 25. He, he stand in a bath? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> a bath oh, or man. Abath was a regular night watchman, and it was Hestan's first night on the shift, or first time on the night shift. This is all new to him. Mm-hmm. Oh, Randy. The security policy maintained that one guard patrolled the galleries with a flashlight and a walkie-talkie, while the other sat at the security desk. Uh, Abath went on patrol first. During his patrol, fire alarms sounded off in different rooms in the museum, but he could not locate any fire or smoke, and that just kept happening. So he returned to the security room with the fire alarm control panel, indicated smoke in multiple rooms. He assumed some kind of malfunction had happened, and so he just shut it all down. Oh, wow. He went (laughs) back on patrol, and before he completed his rounds, he made a quick stop at the side entrance of the museum, briefly opened the exterior side door, and shut it again. Oh, right. He did not tell Hestand why he was doing this. Or that he was doing it at all. Mm-hmm. But we're Rick need a little fresh air, bro. Mm. And I a fresh so. couple millions. <laughs> now something that I need to explain here is that 
number one, it is in the protocol for the night watchman to not ever open the exterior door Mm -hmm. for any reason at all. And if somebody tries to come into the main entrance, you got a two buzzer system, right? They knock on the front door. You got a camera on them Mm -hmm. so you can get a look. And if they don't look suspicious, you can ring them into the little entryway. Mm -hmm. At which time they say who they are, why they're there. And if they're police officers, they have to give their name and their badge number. Mm -hmm. And then you call the police department and verify that they are actual cops. Yeah. Just saying, this is all protocol. Mm -hmm. That's what should be done. Mm Mm-hmm. Man, I just I was with the homies back then, bro. I'd be straight right now. <laughs> now, Abath completed his tour and returned to the security desk around 1 a.m., at which point Heston began his rounds. At 1.20 a.m., the thieves drove up to the side entrance, parked, and walked up to the side door. They rang the buzzer, which connected them to Abath through an intercom. They explained to Abath that they were police investigating a disturbance and needed to be buzzed in. He could see them on the closed-circuit television wearing what appeared to be real police uniforms. He was not aware of any disturbance, but theorized that as it was St. Patrick's Day, perhaps a reveler had climbed over the fence and someone had seen and reported it, so he just let them in Mm. without getting their badge number or anything else. Is that cool? Yeah, that's weird. I see y'all all decked out, weird. (laughs) <laughs> well, given there's so many police officers around that night, because it's mm-hmm. St. Patrick's Day, he's probably like, oh, cool, mm-hmm. I guess so. Police department's probably busy as shit. Nobody's probably going to pick up the phone any fucking way. But, you know, that's actually a good point. Yeah, but still, he's violating protocol. Oh, yeah. well, and he's 23 years old. <laughs> but whatever. So, so fucking straight off this, bro, so much money. <laughs> <Anyway>. They <laughs> approached Abath at his desk and asked if anyone else was in the museum and to bring them down. So Abath radioed Heston to return to the security desk. Abath noticed around this time that the mustache on the taller man appeared to be fake. The shorter man told Abath that he looked familiar and that they may have a warrant for his arrest and to come out from behind the desk and provide identification. Abath complied, stepping away from the desk where the only panic button to alert the police Mm. was. The shorter man forced Abath against the wall, spread his legs, and handcuffed him. Abath noticed that he was not frisked. As Stan walked into the room around this time, and the taller thief turned around and handcuffed him as well. Once both guards were handcuffed, the thieves revealed their true intentions to rob the museum by saying, Gentlemen, this is a robbery. Uh, oh, yeah. That's some movie shit right yes, there. Yes, it is. Just straight up. <laughs> out with it, bro. <laughs> The thieves wrapped duct tape around the heads and eyes of the guards oh, God. in a really weird way. By the way, Abath had really, really long, curly hair. Yeah, bro. Oh, God. He was like a, a rock and roller kid. Uh, yeah. yeah. Now, bro. without asking for directions, they led the guards into the basement where they were handcuffed to a steam pipe and workbench. The thieves examined the wallets of the guards and explained that they knew where they live to not tell authorities anything, and they would get a reward at about a year. Mm. It took, the le- the, it took the thieves less than 15 minutes to subdue the guards. It was now about 1.35 a.m. The thieves' movements through the museum were recorded on infrared motion detectors. Steps in the first room they entered, the Dutch room on the second floor, were not recorded until 1.48 a.m. This was 30, I mean, sorry, this was 13 minutes after they finished subduing the guards, which is weird. Mm-hmm. Well, they're probably, of course either waiting to see if people are going to come, but also looking at their brochure again. Like, all right, so we need to hit this room, this room. <laughs> but that's true. Maybe they did go over the plan yeah. real quick. Yeah, like, maybe so. Right, we'll go here first, and then to trick them, we're going to go do some wild shit, mm-hmm. and then come back over here. You know what I mean? They've they gone over the plan again. I see that happening. Okay. Yeah, you know I, 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 mean? I like that. Yeah, yeah. So anyways, as the thieves uh, approached the paintings in the Dutch room, a device began beeping that would normally uh, trip when a patron was too close to a painting. The thieves smashed it. They took the storm on the Sea of Galilee and a lady and gentleman in black and threw them on the marble floor, which shattered their glass frames. Using a blade, they cut the canvases out of their stretchers. What? They also removed a large Rembrandt self-portrait oil painting from the wall, but they left it leaning against a cabinet. Investigators believe that they may have considered it too large to transport, potentially because it was painted on wood, they not could roll that a durable canvas. Yeah. Yeah. So what you're doing is, you know, classic heist movie shit, people. Yeah. You roll that motherfucker up, 
throw it in a little tubey real quick. Mm-hmm. Get another one. That's there in but the hatchback. Still though, like even they said in that the Netflix docu series that like you don't do that. Mm-hmm. Like it uh. cracks. It's yeah. old. Like, yeah. That uh. paint will come off. Oh. You will ruin mm. that painting mm. beyond even selling it on okay. a black market. Okay. Yeah. So maybe you it's know? the frames. Because if you have just paintings layered and stacked, maybe a lot easier to move around. Yeah. And then wooden fucking frames. Uh, but instead of the uh, self-portrait painted on wood, they took a small postage stamp size self-portrait etching by Rembrandt on display beneath the larger portrait, which was not that expensive. So it was kind of like, oh, there's a picture of Rembrandt. We can't take that one. Well, there's another one of him. Mm. So I guess they clearly just didn't know what the fuck they were doing. As far as what they were stealing. This was an assignment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Fucking assignment. On the right side of the room, room, they removed a landscape with uh, obelisk and the concert from their frames. The final piece taken from the Dutch room was an ancient Chinese goo, which is like a little um, chalice, like a little, Mm -hmm. little drinking vessel. At uh, 1.51 a.m., while one thief continued working in the Dutch room, the other entered a narrow hallway dubbed the short gallery on the other end of the second floor. The other thief joined in there soon. In this room, they began removing screws for a frame displaying a Napoleonic flag, likely an effort to steal the flag, of course, but they appeared to have given up partway through as not all the screws were removed, and ultimately only took the exposed eagle uh, finial atop the the flag the flagpole, yeah. which also was not worth that much money. Mm-hmm. No. They also took five uh, Degas sketches from the room. The last were uh, stolen was a uh, Shelley Tortoni from the Blue Room on the first floor. The museum's motion detector did not detect any motion within the blue room during the thieves' time in the building. The only footsteps detected in the room that night were Abath's during the two times he passed through the gallery on his patrol earlier, which is odd. Yeah, that is odd. My boy. It might be. My boy Ricky. Mm -hmm. Ricky. As they prepared (laughs) to leave, the thieves checked on the guards one last time and asked if they were comfortable. (laughs) They then moved the security director's office, moved to the security director's office where they took the video cassettes that recorded their entrance on the uh, closed circuit cameras and the data printouts from the motion detecting equipment. The movement da- uh, data was still captured on a hard drive, though, which remained untouched, which probably means they didn't know it was there. They knew all that other shit was there. Of course. But not that. I think it's the 80s, bro, or yeah. the 90s, actually. Now, the frame for the Shea Tortoni was left at the security uh, director's desk, which seems like a pretty strong middle finger to me, mm-hmm. but, you know, whatever. It's like, hey, bitch, look at this. Uh-huh. <laughs> look you know where this came from, did, did. Yeah. <laughs> The thieves then moved to take the artwork out of the museum. The side entrance doors were opened once at 2.40 a.m. and again for the last time at 2.45 a.m. The robbery lasted 81 minutes. That's a long fucking time. Yeah, they, they took their time, bro. Yeah. Man, that is either confidence or cockiness. They may have been confident because they knew that they were fine or they were cocky as hell. No, they, they, were they, they were confident at first and then they got cocky later on, I feel like. With the whole like leaving the frame and like just mm-hmm. taking a little dumb shit for no reason. Yeah, that's you know a good what point. I mean? Yeah, like, no, I like that. Oh, fuck it. Yeah. Take this too. Fuck it. I'll take that too, bitch. Mm-hmm. Now, <laughs> the next shift of guards arrived later in the morning and realized something was amiss when they could not establish contact with any anyone inside to be let in. <laughs> They called in the security director who, upon entering the building with his keys, found nobody at the watch desk and called the police. The police searched the building until they finally found the guards still tied up in the basement. I wonder if they had, like, soiled themselves or anything by that point. Because oh, that was a long time just chilling. They probably were. Bro, you got yeah. duct tape on your head. Yeah. And you just handcuffed to a pipe. Yeah. Don't mm-hmm. know if you're going to get shot later. Right. But- <laughs> That's some, that's some real come to Jesus moment right yeah. there, boy. Well, it's mm-hmm. a little poop in your pants. Mm-hmm. That is a little bit of poop in your <laughs> pants. At least some peepees. All in all, 13 <laughs> works were stolen. In 1990, the, the FBI estimated the value of the hall at $200 million. Mm. And that has estimate has been raised to $500 million was, by the year 2000. So. Yeah. In the late 2000s, some art dealers suggest the hall could be worth about $600 million. Oof. It was considered the highest value muse- museum robbery in history. 
until it was surpassed by the Dresden Green Vault burglary in 2019. Oh, yeah, that shit was lit right there. Oh, that's crazy. I went to um, a Dresden art festival where they brought the art from the Dresden Museum, and we got to see all kinds of stuff when I went to go see oh, um, cool. A Perfect Circle in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh-huh. Oh, shit. And so Corey and I went to the, the concert, and then we went to the Dresden Art Gallery yeah, stuff, yeah. and we still got, like, stuff from that. Wow. That's wild. I didn't know they were yeah, robbed bro. in 2019. Yeah. yeah, they got that shit hit, bro. Whoa. Yeah, bro. That's a wild story. But anyway. Now, the most valuable works uh, were taken from the Dutch room. Among these were the concert by the Dutch painter Vermeer. Uh, he was 1632 to 1675 is when he was alive, which he only uh, painted 34 paintings, they think. Oh. And so the painting accounts for half of the hall's value estimated at 250 God. million dollars in 2015 that's crazy experts believe it may be the most valuable stolen object in the world Oof. in the same room the thieves targeted works by dutch painter rembrandt uh these included the storm on the sea of galilee galilee which is his only seascape he's ever done and hmm. it's fucking gorgeous and it's the most it's valuable of his works um, so beautiful and it was stolen that night estimates have placed its value at about 140 million since that robbery the ever rembrandt works were taken uh, were a lady and gentleman in black and a small postage stamp Size self portrait etching, like I said earlier. The latter was previously stolen and <laughs> returned in 1970, actually. <laughs> the thieves may have taken a uh, landscape with uh, obelisk, believing it was a Rembrandt. It was long attributed to him until it was quietly credited to his pupil, uh, Govert Flink, uh, a few le- years before the actual heist. Oh, so maybe they were just going after Rembrandt's. You know, maybe yeah. That's what it sounds who like they mostly. wanted was his stuff. Who knows? The last item taken from the Dutch room was a bronze goo about 10 inches uh, tall, traditionally used for serving wine in ancient China. The beaker was one of the oldest works in the museum, dating back to the Shang dynasty in the 12th century BC. Ooh, we're but we covered that once. Its <laughs> estimated value is only several thousand dollars. Only several thousand. Only several. But thousand. still, if you're Crazy. talking about two hundred and fifty million to, I don't know, yeah. twelve thousand. I mean, like, come on. Also, bro, twelfth century BC, fucking chalice. That's fucking badass. Mm-hmm. That seems like a like. I'm. I'm. This is for my cabinet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, <laughs> hey, you, you know where I got this cup, bro. I only drink whiskey out of this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, hey, man, check out this cool cup I got. Oh, dude, check out this cool gold needle I got. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's a stuff thing. That's not our collection. It's like, look at my stuff. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> not my collection. You know what I'm saying? It's a difference. <laughs> <laughs> now, in the short gallery, five sketches by the French artist Edgar Degas were stolen. Uh but they were each done on paper and less than a square foot in size and made by pencils with inks, washes, and charcoal. They're of relatively little value compared with the other works that were stolen, worth under $100,000 combined. Also taken was that imperial uh, fi- eagle, finial, mm-hmm. you know, from the flag. There is a $100,000 reward for information leading to the return of just that finial alone. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. Uh, <clears throat> again, I think that's just them taking stuff. Mm-hmm. Or maybe they thought it was solid gold, and they were like, well, we can melt that down and right. keep it for ourselves. Who knows? You know what I mean? And then again, there was just that only that one item taken from the first floor, mm-hmm. but they never actually recorded their steps. Just a whole bunch of weird shit. Just, just Dude, wild everything shit, about this is so weird. Wild shit. So, like, we're basically what we're talking about is this eclectic mix of items has puzzled experts. While some other paintings were valuable, the thieves passed over other valuable works by, like, Raphael, Botticelli, Michelangelo. That's oh, crazy. Wow. And they left them completely undisturbed. That's crazy, bro. Yeah. Uh, and then they never entered the third floor, which is kind of crazy, just to never not go on an entire floor. Unless yeah. you've got a map, like Justin was talking yeah. about. Maybe they're like yeah. surveying their yeah, like, list of doing. things and where they are, right? Yeah, yeah. If I was in an art gallery, I wouldn't go to the highest floor for sure. <laughs> like, I would definitely want to see the highest floor if I'm still yeah. in an art gallery. I mean, mm-hmm. that's it's kind probably of the, the finale shit. of the it's, thing. You exactly. know what I mean? Like, yeah. It's probably the last little final situation up there. Uh, up there, uh, 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 Titian's The Rape of the Europa Hung. Uh, the Rape of Europa, that was on the third floor. And that's one of the most valuable paintings in the city. That's crazy. And they just didn't even 
Mm. Go like, check. Go, you yeah. know what I mean? We good, bro. We got a little golden eagle. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> we got a little chalice, bro. We, we chilling, sure, sure. Bro. We chilling. Now, the selection of works <laughs> and the brutish ways the thieves handled their artwork has led investigators to believe that the thieves were not experts. You don't say. Mm-hmm. Just throwing a shoe on the ground. <laughs> now, this is kind of crazy. As uh, Gardner's will decreed nothing in her collection should be moved, the empty frames for the stolen paintings remain hanging in their respective locations Whoa. in the museum as placeholders for their potential return. Wow. Yeah. That's worth going to see just to be like, yeah. oh, damn. Yeah. Or actually like take the trail they took just yeah. to see how long it would actually take. Yeah, anyway. yeah, that would be kind of fun. Now, because of the museum's low funds and lack of insurance policy... <laughs> The director solicited help from Sotheby's and Christie's auction houses to propose to post a reward of one million dollars within three days. This was increased to five million dollars in nineteen ninety seven. <laughs> Seven years later, and in two thousand seventeen, it was doubled to ten million dollars, mm. with an expiration date set for the end of two thousand seventeen. This reward was extended following an outpouring tips uh, an outpouring of tips from the public. It is the largest bounty ever offered by a private institution. The reward is for information that leads directly to the recovery of all of their items in good condition. Federal prosecutors have stated that anyone who willingly returns the items will not be prosecuted. Huh. Now, the most important aspect of that, so if anybody out there does actually know anything, mm -hmm. the feds can't do anything anymore. Yeah. They will lie to you. They, they will, will happily lie no, to no. you. Oh, yeah. But the statute of limitations expired in 1995. So you mm. can just, hey, so bro, I've been, take it. Yeah, if I've you want chilling. $10 million, <laughs> like, you know, please bring it back to them. And they legally cannot charge you with the shit. Yeah, they can't be prosecuted. <laughs> wow. It's crazy. That's insane. So, um, that Netflix documentary and just a whole bunch of new shit has come out or whatever. So that's that's the robbery that happened. And then this is just a whole bunch of new shit, right? The feds now think that the two robbers were uh, George Reisfelder mm -hmm. and Lenny Demuzio, both of whom died within a year of the heist. Oh, shit. The two yeah, men yeah. belonged to the crew of local criminal Carmelo Merloni. I'm sorry, Merlino, who was first mentioned in connection with the 25-year-old robbery way back in 1992. That's some Italian mafia shit. But Reisfelder and Demuzio have also been suspects in the case for many years, but their role in the burglary is only now being confirmed. The FBI announced in 2014 that they had identified who was responsible and revealed details about the investigation over the years, but declined to name names. Rice Felder, a career criminal, <laughs> was only free to commit the notorious crime because he was cleared of a murder charge in 1982, thanks to his lawyer, John Kerry. Oh, shit. Oh, wow. The Secretary of State. Holy fuck, bro. He had, he had John Kerry as a lawyer, bro. <laughs> yeah. That dude was connected, dog. Yes, he was. That's some mob shit right there, Yes, bro. very, very much yeah, so. Kerry was appointed by the court to defend Reisfelder during his appeal after the other man involved in the killing gave a deathbed confession, identifying another criminal as his accomplice. After Reisfelder was released, he and Kerry, then a candidate for Lieutenant Lieutenant Governor went out for a celebratory beer and a, an occasion that made local newscasts. <laughs> yeah. He just walking around with his uh his client about to go party. It's like Yeah, dog. Oh, that's the son of like somebody that's paying you money. Hurt. I mean, come on. I get it. Like, I get it, bro. You you <laughs> apparently get appointed by the court, bullshit. Mm -hmm. And then you go have a beer with the guy. Nah. Like lawyers don't do that. Nah. You know what I mean? Nah, bro. They were butts. <laughs> mm -hmm. I remember I was there when he was born, you know. Uh Love the kid. He's a good kid. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't see him doing anything like this. Uh, <laughs> no, his father. We have business yeah. deals. All that type of bullshit. So, bro. before long, though, uh, Reisfelder was back to his criminal ways, including the gardener job. Gary, of course, stayed on the straight and narrow because he had, you know, politics, typical yeah. politic. Merlino arranged <laughs> the now infamous heist, possibly at the behest of another unknown party. In which Reisfelder and Demuzio dressed as Boston police officers in order to trick the night watchman into letting them in. Yes, less than a year later, uh, Reisfelder died from a very suspicious drug overdose. Oh, yeah. And Demuzio was murdered and uh, 
probably because uh, Merlino discovered a like a planned clue, a coup that he was leading or whatever. Mm. But Demuzio was shot, decapitated, and put in the trunk of his own car. That's fun. Yeah. Stabbed himself in the back tre- three times and threw himself over a bridge. Sounds like sounds like the old Iceman. Yeah. Like the real Iceman. Go check that motherfucker right. out. Anyway. Now, the, <laughs> the paintings, of course, were never recovered. And Merlino died in 2005 from diabetes. The hunt for the paintings from the Isabella Stewart Gardner heist continues. The investigators also said that they suspected the art was transported via organized crime networks to Connecticut and then eventually the Philadelphia region. You don't say. Where the thieves attempted to sell the works on the black market. After those attempts, after those attempted sales, however, the artwork trail goes cold. Apparently, Whitey Bulger is involved in that. Oh, Whitey, shit. It's I, kind of been debunked, and so I didn't put it in here. I'm really yeah. surprised. Whitey Bulger is involved in a lot of shit, bro. Yeah. <laughs> like a yeah. bunch of wild shit, like CIA testing and all that other wild shit. Yeah. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. MK Ultra, bro. Mm-hmm. Whitey yeah. Bulger was yeah. involved in that shit. Of course he was. Yeah. I just went to Europe with the shits, bro. Like, just sell them back to Europe. Like, right? I, Hey, do you remember the Take homie? Take back to Italy. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. You remember the homie that used to be out here, like, in the 1800s? I got one of his pictures, bro. Like, <laughs> that shit crazy, right? Listen, all I need is, like, a villa on the side of a mountain. Yeah. Don't tell nobody my address. Yeah. You know what I mean? I know. Just send me all the fresh noodles yeah. and pasta right. daily. You know, and the fresh olive of wine. Oil. Exactly. You know, I'm good. One of them Sicilian gals with Gucci. You know what I'm yeah. saying? <laughs> now, authorities, uh, and myself included, were initially suspicious of the two young guards on duty that night. Abath, a self-described hippie and rock guitarist, uh, was a regular on the night shift. <laughs> because of art cri- uh, 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 of this nature typically require an inside source, he was high on the list of possible conspirators. Yeah, the motherfucker opened well, the back door? Okay. For no reason yeah. at all, it, it, according oh, to him. And he self-described himself as a hippie and a rock star, yeah. uh, like a rock guitarist. There's nothing that says, think for yourself, question authority more than what that is. Exactly. So, also, Ricky. he had put in his two weeks notice <laughs> that night, or that day, uh. before his shift, and he was going to a Grateful Con- Dead concert the very next night. Oh, yeah, my boy was ready. Yeah. He's like, yeah, where yeah, he but, had nitrous money. Yes, he all did. All of a sudden, you know? Yep. <laughs> hey, yo, shake down street like, bro, let me get a whole zip from you, bro. <laughs> yeah, right. I don't only get ounces sometimes. But I, mean, I only get, like, joints sometimes. I need a whole zip, bro. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Give me a book of L, bro. And if you don't know what a zip is, you're not ready. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, Abath, for his part, has long denied any role in the heist, and authorities have generally cleared him as a person of interest. When he took a like a, an interview with uh, uh, Tom Mashberg from the New York Times in 2015, he said, I was just this hippie guy who wasn't hurting anything. I wasn't on anybody's radar. And the next day, I was on everybody's radar for the largest art heist in history. You, you don't say, Ricky. Yeah. <laughs> Why'd you open the door, Ricky? Huh? <laughs> and another wrinkle, Abbas's role in the drama once again came under scrutiny in 2015 when the United States uh, Attorney's Office in Massachusetts released a rare security camera video. The grainy footage shows Abath, who was on guard during the day of March 17th, opened the same side doors used Ooh. by the thieves and admitted an unidentified man in a waist-length coat and an upturned collar. Hmm. So. Nice. Uh, he as either being suspicious just on the point of being suspicious, or he knew that fucking camera was there. And yeah. so he had his collar turned up against yeah. it. You know what I mean? You know, and that's some straight gangster shit, too, that pop collar. That is very true. Well, that, that's, it sounds like Ricky, this is my theory already, before we even end. My theory is Ricky owes some fucking drug money to the mob, <laughs> and he was buying it from this dude's son. Maybe. And dude's dad was like, oh, they got a bunch of paintings over there. He owes us, like, a grand Let's get two hundred million. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, you feel me? Like, yep. that's the line of yep. of shit I'm saying. But you know, that's just me. Uh, <laughs> as the Guardian reports, dozens of theories ranging from conspiratorial, uh, conspiratorial to credible have cropped up over the years. Most people, including the FBI, argue that the works traveled through organized crime networks in Boston, namely the mob. Mm-hmm. The Netflix documentary we mentioned several times now, entitled This is a Robbery, is less interested in who done it and more interested in tracking where the paintings might have ended up. The narrative centers on Bobby Donati, a mobster 
who may have organized the theft with fellow criminal Robert or Bobby. I think it's Garanti, Garanti, I think. Garanti. Yeah, in order to Bobby use and Bobby. the art as a bargaining chip to get their friend, Vincent Ferrara, out of jail. Hmm. Yeah, so it's hard. Like, imagine trying to sell a Rembrandt. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's next to impossible, right? Yeah. So and what stay they, under the radar at exactly. that? Exactly. Well, no, it's like, I was at this yard sale, bro. The psh, <laughs> my just had it in the yeah. back. Yeah. Now, it's a ramp brown. You know who that is? <laughs> I just thought it was cool. Yeah. He so, was just like, anyways, yeah, so this is a ramp brown. And I was like, no, nah, I don't remember that at all. Yeah, remember that? I don't remember shit. I don't know what you're talking about. I ain't remember that. <laughs> no, no, I ain't remember you that. Go, you go down on 10th over there. He had a little garage sale last Saturday. <laughs> He has some good guitars out there too, you know what I mean? Uh, nigga just had a picture. A couple coconuts with faces on them, you know. I thought I was, was going to take it to the thrift store, but then they told me you might want it, so you know. Oh man. <laughs> this shit is crazy, bro. Oh. So, another former mobster um Oh, I'm sorry. I'm skipping ahead around here. What was uh, what did I say? He's trying to get his homie out of jail. Yeah, yeah. So know. both Donati and uh, Garanti are now dead. So we of course. we'll never know. Yeah, of course. Yeah, now, yeah, uh, Bobby and Bobby got hit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's a... Well, actually, uh, Donati was mysterious death. Now, Garanti, he died of uh, cancer as an older man. Oh. Hmm. But uh, his friend, another former mobster, Robert Gentile has long maintained his innocence despite a bevy of evidence pointing to his involvement in the crime. Uh, the octogenarian was released from prison in 2019 after serving 54 months on an unrelated charge. He was selling Roxy's. Uh, mm-hmm. He had prescriptions to him because he was an old man yeah. and just turned around and selling them. Yeah, of course. <laughs> that's that mob mentality shit. That's that, well, that's street life, period. Yeah, just straight up. Yeah. Yeah. Straight up. So... Uh, Actually, to Gentile, and then we'll we'll kind of finish it up or whatever. But a, um, I was listening to this podcast, and I found a little more that could be connected to all this. So apparently, Garanti uh, met up with his buddy Gentile for lunch one day. It was a double date, right? Mm-hmm. So was, their wives were there, and Garanti's wife recalled the two men looking in their trunk at some tubes, like poster tubes. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. He gave these tubes to Gentile. Now, the feds learned of this trunk deal in 2010 and started watching Gentile to make a mistake. In 2012, he was taken in for selling oxys and some other narcotics. He was in his 70s, so they figured he would give up the information so he could stay out of jail for the end of his life, right? Of course. Yeah. But he only agreed to a polygraph, which he failed every single question of. <laughs> yeah. I'm so old, man. I'm old. He is admitted to say that he's only seen the small Rembrandt self portrait, the one that was stolen and then returned, and that's the only one he's seen. I don't know. Sounds a little fishy yeah. to me. I didn't see anything else. They yeah. just showed me the little bitty stamp, yeah. bro. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Because that's the, somebody's going to carry that one around by itself. Because that's what you brag about. Like, <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> You know, when yeah. you steal something. Uh, I don't know. Not yeah, the man. $250 million <laughs> yeah. dollar one. Man, I got this toenail off the floor. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't care what you say. The, the 12th century chalice, bro, I'm showing that to everybody. Bro. Oh, yeah. Hey, <laughs> hey, hey. <laughs> you know, it's a little something special made thousands of years ago. But anyway. that, uh, that wasn't enough for the feds, so they locked him up, like I said. Mm. Unfortunately, his daughter died during that time while he was in jail. But... The feds also searched his home and found a newspaper clipping that had all of the prices listed for each piece stolen. Oh. He's sitting there like, yeah, can we take it my uh-huh. 15 mil out like this shit, boy? <laughs> I know my 15 mil somewhere at this 600. And Gentile's son told the feds about a false floor and a work shed in their backyard. Uh-uh. When they searched that, they found a large space with an empty plastic bin inside. An old junior also recounted a story from years prior when a big storm had caused their backyard and the shed to flood. Mm. Gentile flipped out. Junior had never seen him so upset. So was he just embarrassed that he ruined all these timeless and priceless pieces of Holy art? Holy shit. Uh, maybe, Holy shit. No, honestly, I don't know. Maybe uh, let's think about real quick, street street knowledge real quick, tap in. <clears throat> So, if you try to bury money or put money anywhere subterranean level, you have to make sure that it's properly aired out. Or sealed, yeah. Sealed, because it mm-hmm. will get moldy. Oh, yeah. And if it gets wet, 
and it's still wrapped up or whatever, not properly sealed, it's going to get molded. Yeah. You're going to ruin all that fucking money. Right. You know what I mean? I know mm-hmm. some, no names, but I know some people that yeah. have lost but see, that's, thousands and thousands of dollars. That was kind of, of my thought, too. It was like money got molded, and you can't fix that shit. Like no, you it's can't. Not sticking together and ripping and shit. And like, if you're yeah. talking about 12th century paintings, yeah. right? or 12th but, century anything, bro, mo- or money, even money, dollar bills, years old. Money, fucking old paintings, any type of canvas, Man, paper, yeah. anything like that is going to get moldy as shit if you don't seal it properly. Right. So, so it was either money or it was paintings. And I don't know. <laughs> and I would have been fucking hot if it was money. Uh, yeah. But I mean, let's <laughs> say that he did do that and somehow he didn't know any better. But I mean, come on, he's a pro. He should have known bro. better. Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. It's probably money. Probably. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Well, those paintings are money. Because the paintings, you can't keep those paintings stationary, bro. Mm-mm. That's way too hot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, this shit's got to be moving every right. week, probably. Yeah. Yeah, that's, you know that's I mean? probably yeah, true, yeah, yeah. honestly. See, I'm giving too much of my criminal mind. So, yeah. either way. <laughs> oh, shut up, Just Now, once once Gentile got out of jail, he did reach out to a reporter saying he knew something about the Gardner case. But he didn't real, reveal any more of that and only used his time with the interviewer to rail on the FBI and saying that they ruined his life. <laughs> of course. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah, the reporter couldn't get anything else out of him. <laughs> it's like, I was supposed to be somewhere in Peru for the rest of my fucking life. Yeah. So how He's, do you feel about this? Fuck the FBI. Yeah. But um, for real, though, no, fuck the FBI. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At the same time, who knows? I could have been doing it for the fucking FBI. Mm. You know what I mean? Who knows? Well, with close uh, with their close ties to the mafia back that's, then. That's what I'm saying, bro. You never know what's going on out here in this world. Bro. Yeah. Mm. Now, the um, back to uh, the Netflix uh, documentary, um, they had a, also another theory that included uh, members of the IRA or the Irish Republic yeah. Army oh, yeah, that were IRA. somehow involved. And I think it's probably only because the IRA before had used like really massively valuable pieces of art as leverage, mm-hmm. you know, to get someone and they were out. And they were red know? hot in the fucking 80s and 90s. That's yeah. when they were like out here with it for real. But that seems, I mean, it's possible. Of course it's possible. But it seems a little <coughs> bit of a stretch to me. But you It's know, a stretch for sure, bro. Yeah. But I'll they have also another of your day's best. They also <laughs> interviewed this dude, Miles Connor Jr. I fucking love this guy. So he is this convicted art thief who was he was in jail at the time of this particular robbery, but he has like done broad daylight, like smash and grab art th- heists before. He also broke into oh, yeah, this like dude, private uh, mansion in like Boston's wealthiest neighborhood and stole like hundreds of thousands of dollars of, of paintings before. Bro, like he he's is still alive, bro. a fucking G. He is a, still alive. <laughs> he is out of jail. And apparently he's got a kid they, in the mob that took a reporter to this warehouse in Brooklyn one time. And, Disappeared her. And then showed mm-hmm. him this uh, apparently one of the Rembrandts that was stolen from the Gardner thing. Mm-hmm. That was apparently Miles Connor Jr.'s shed. They searched that shed and there's nothing in there anymore. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, bro, he's, he's, he's like one of those old, like, uh, like the last breed of like, I truly don't give a shit yeah. about society at all. Right. And in that documentary, he's just sitting in his fucking yard full of shit, like collectors or whatever, pack rap type bullshit. And it's like, yeah, I remember that. I seen it. It's like, you just seen it, bro? Like, what else? Yeah. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> so, that's funny. I, I read it. I forgot that we were, this week's was on the heart, art heist because of life. And, um, <laughs> sure. And it wasn't my episode, so. <laughs> just <kidding. laughs> I forgot. Yeah. That's just how the world works. Yeah. But um, I did read this um, article about 142, and I had to just pull it up again because I couldn't remember. 142 looted artifacts returned to Italy after New York investigation. Oh, wow. And it was this dude, uh, and he, I mean, he had some fresco paintings and all kinds of like, Mm -hmm. um, but it was a hedge fund, uh, billionaire and collector named, uh, Michael Steinhardt. Yeah. And he, he's kind of acquire shit. And it's like, Oh, how did I acquire it? I don't know. I just Mm -hmm. had it. Hmm. Yeah. Let's see. That's a bigger scale of like, I was at this yard sale. Right. Right. Of course. (laughs) Like, like, wait, how did you get this? And this is literally eight days ago. It's fucking wild. Yeah. That is crazy. Yeah. The, uh, um, dated back to the fourth century, the painting, some of the paintings. Yeah. Shit. Yeah. 
But uh, uh, Miles Conner Jr., he did at the very least like provide like really essential context about how the underground art market operated during the 1990s, primarily in Boston. You know what I mean? So if nothing else, just fucking fell in love with that guy. Yeah. It's like, Jesus, what a G. Mm-hmm. And Straight up G, bro, for real. <laughs> and he also <laughs> g- did give them, I mean, it was because so, he's like just chilling in a chair, just like, I mean. It's like by a tree, on. like in a yard, in <laughs> Don't a lawn you get chair, it? just yeah, like, 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 come on. Like, it's yeah. pretty obvious that this or that mm-hmm. or that happened. Like, you know, yeah. it, it just, I felt like he was explaining something that just seems so obvious to yeah. him. Yeah. Uh, because it's his world, you know, yeah. of course. Right. But still. It's like um, a mechanic explaining to you, a regular person how to change oil. Oh, yeah, yeah. right. Like, you, you know, you just... Come on, man. You, you just, just... Fuck it. Uh, all right. right. Yeah. Fuck <laughs> it. Just get, it, get out the way. Here's a fun <laughs> quote from the, the director of the docuseries. Uh, Researching the case was like learning the game of chess. <laughs> the more you know about it, the more options you see. But he also urged that... Uh, Anybody with information about the stolen artworks should contact security chief Amor at reward at gardnermuseum.org. And reminder, the museum is offering a $10 million reward to anyone who provides information leading directly to the safe return of the stolen works. And they legally cannot do anything to they you. They cannot do anything but anymore. give you the money. Other than that, <laughs> yeah, the baby. individuals whose information leads to the restitution of some but not all of the works will receive a partial reward. Anyone who helps return the Napoleonic Eagle fin- Finial will receive a separate $100,000 reward. Yeah, man. People, I'm just saying, if you're like grandpa, like just you found something in his house yeah. when he died, you know he was connected to the Boston Mafia, Cash and there's a damn, random man. golden eagle sitting in your cabinet. Yeah, go get the hundred grand. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and you know you can always support us at uh, friends. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> you know, whenever you do, just hit us up. You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> mm. Yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> we out here. We out here with it. Oh uh, man, that's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> friends, facts, and fiction struggle bus. Yeah, it's awesome. I mean, <laughs> but, yeah. but isn't that fun? Yeah, that's fucking wild. That's bro. awesome. It is just like the most, and I mean, I, I really highly do recommend that docu series just because it's the most fucking Boston thing you'll ever watch. Yeah, like there's a dude sitting at a bar. Thickest Boston accent ever, you know. Oh and, yeah, and, that guy. and he's just hilarious, you know. He's like, <laughs> it's that Boston that's almost Irish. Like, yeah, like, yeah. like yeah. Boston hot corn, oh, yeah. Boston yeah. culture out yeah. here. Yeah, bro. You're like, what? I want to sound like no highfalutin kind of guy or nothing, but you know that yeah. kind of shit. And he's just <laughs> sipping whiskey, bro. Mm-hmm. Like I'm talking about a glass of whiskey, just chilling. And then like that, one of the FBI agents that is involved in the case several times, I swear, several times. She's like, "But that's just Boston," and I'm like, <laughs> "You just talked about these dudes that killed these other people and put them in a trunk because they probably stole this oh, uh, like hundreds of million dollars of art to work mm-hmm. as leverage against their boss or their buddy's boss to get them out <laughs> yeah. of jail." She's like, that's just Boston, you know. That's <laughs> my <laughs> life. And he, you know, it was, Why will we will? Yeah, like, right. Dude, seriously? It shows me out, it's like, crazy. Documentaries like that and also like documentaries like mafia shit and interview like these ex-mafia cats or like, you know, these dudes that are affiliated with the mafia and the way they talk about shit, I'm like, oh, we're, go, go, go. Yeah, we just, you know, we put up broad daylight. We dump like six clips. You know what I mean? It just happens sometimes. Word, bro. It just happens sometimes. Oh, okay. Just like them, just like them gang documentaries where you know mm-hmm. drive by and show I'm like, word, bro. Like, hey, you know, <laughs> word. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I need you on my team when the shit go down, bro. Right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But I thought it was just um, one a very very fun story. Two, I love the fact that we got to start that long ago and it's still technically still ongoing. Going. You know, it's nuts. and then three, you know, like with the um, like prohibition stuff. Like this is a direct result. Mm-hmm. Like this is a direct consequence of us yeah. trying to make America a little safer or more realistically a bunch of religious home housewives got really pissed off with their husbands drinking too much and then they unintentionally started I mean like like Boston is still kind of but like really badly was just 
massive crime unit and massive yeah. crime family, yeah, always right. at odds with each other. They'll kill half of them. There'd be a power vacuum, so another one would pop mm-hmm. up. And like the feds are just running around, being as fucking dirty and backdoor dealing as the fucking mobsters are. Yeah, you got it's crazy. Boston, there. Maryland, Baltimore, New Jersey. Yeah. Newark, New Jersey, uh, fucking anywhere in New York in the fucking 90s. Like, Buffalo, bro, Buffalo in the 90s. Holy shit. Sure. I mean, after hearing all this shit, like, it had to have been an inside job. As Ricky. far as uh, uh, hey Ricky, <laughs> oh Ricky didn't take a bath, <laughs> my boy Ricky. Uh, but uh, it had to have been not and and an inside job coordinated from the outside, you know. And oh, it 100%. seems it yeah. seems to me, I mean, yeah, they, it could have been mob involvement and everything. Obviously, well, with probably the deaths was involved, that's definitely mob influence. But right. also. I'm kind of leaning pretty hard on like uh, like FBI kind of involvement kind of shit because why mm-hmm. with all of the technology that we have now mm-hmm. is this still a mystery? Right. Come on, yeah. You know, I mean, I- yeah. You should be able to have if these people. I mean, you're probably true. Like some these, hands got greased. If these people you. that stole this shit had their hands on this stuff and weren't wearing gloves. We have DNA technology mm-hmm. that if they thought it was them, yeah. they could match it up and figure that out. Yeah, but true. that just hasn't come out. Yeah. Well, apparently in that docu series, and I didn't mention it here, um, there were some pretty crucial things that got bungled pretty hard by the local PD. Mm. Like right after, like they came in, they found the guards. Like they threw away the duct tape. What? Yeah. See, inside yeah. job, Accidentally. inside job, mm-hmm. baby. Mm-hmm. Right, bro, that's <laughs> what I'm sticking with. So you like, so how much your mortgage a year? I got you. <laughs> yeah. Turn your head the other way. Yeah, no, yep. seriously. Damn. I mean, yeah. like straight up. Yeah. That's all it took back then, bro. Actually, that's all it kind of takes these days. I mean, I mean that shit ain't just, over with, bro. Motherfuckers yeah. still corrupt out here. Come I mean, I, I really mm-hmm. do think, unfortunately, that those paintings are gone. Oh, yeah, yeah. I do too. Like, they, hopefully, I mean, it's sad to say that hopefully they're just in the basement of some fucking hedge fund billionaire Right, you know, I don't know, bro. That's 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 that uh, loves the idea of like this is mine. Mm-hmm. You know, what's that joint? Uh, Thomas Crown Affair, bro. Oh, know that yeah. movie? Yeah, some shit like that. Where it's like this is my lake house or my beach house in Mexico, and I got these crazy ass paintings in here, yeah. bro. I I don't remember where that came from. Mm-hmm. Low, low key, it's probably yeah. a fucking Rembrandt. You know what I mean? Like sure. it's like that, bro. Like you, these people move in different circles, dog. There's a whole nother. Don't hear, don't see, don't speak. Mm-hmm. You feel me? Take that with you. Yeah. Also, I had a weird thing happen. We were in the middle of that episode. It uh, something popped up on my screen that said your webinar vlog has ended. You want a webinar? What? Anyway, mm-hmm. who knows? I'm gonna slide up out of there. Hey, we need to stop talking about this, maybe. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think we reached our limit on the. Old, yeah, the, they were like, "Oh, these kids don't know shit." These Never kids, mind. and then they, they, they pull out like, "Something about the FBI." And like, Webinar has ended. That's what I said. I think we, <laughs> Drew gets to go to jail. Then we lost our number on the fun bun investigators' uh, <laughs> words. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> yeah, man, um, the Arhais that is still a mystery to this day. The Great Arhais. One of mm-hmm. the greatest, you know, Ocean Eleven shit. Some hot facts. Um, hope y'all doing good out there. Remember, you can support us at friends period dot facts dot fiction at gmail dot com. Email us there, anchor dot fm backslash friends facts and fiction. You can support us there. You can subscribe to us there. Uh, give us that five star review. Give us that thumbs up. Give us that uh, Instagram follow. DM me or whatever. We out here. You know what I'm saying, stay involved. Stay in tuned. Um, yeah, man, I love y'all. Justin Hammonds, I'm saying love, live life because it's worth living, y'all. I'm Drew Shonut. I'm saying listen to the full episode. <laughs> cool to people not. <laughs> <laughs> Some listener retention. Uh, That's okay. okay. That's okay. I mean, you guys you know. love you. Love you all to death. Yeah. Thank you so much for listening. And I, that was kind of a joke, kind of a jab. <laughs> but uh, And I stand behind both of those 100%. Sure. But um, yeah, no. Thank you so much for uh, tuning into our depraved podcast <laughs> that we provide you <laughs> but uh yeah man love you guys grant bramlett here um to everybody anybody out there have you ever took a priceless piece of art smashed it on the ground and then cut that bitch out of its frame with a with a goddamn razor blade <laughs> <laughs>
I never liked you <laughs> at all. Like that's a, I will stand behind that statement uh, big time. Yeah. Now, if you ever uh, find out that somebody did something like that and then you turn them in or at least find the, the art back to its rightful home so it could be enjoyed by the public or if you returned it back to its rightful country. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. Craziness. Like, like, like uh, all these African artifacts that are just uh, chilling in London get, get me galleries. Like, I mean, oh, come God, on, man. Me like, Jesus shit. Christ. Oof. Anyways, if you contributed it to the innocent, anything like that, I always loved you. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. No. There you go. <laughs> bang, Which is very few of you out there. <laughs> <laughs> if any. Yeah, hopefully. Um, but yeah, um, definitely, man. Art is a beautiful piece of life. I, like, I love every form of art. From food to paint to dance to rhythm, anything, music, all that. Even that tippy toe dance. Even the tippy toe dance. Sweet, right. sweet. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Remember, in a sense, we all are art. So, you know, keep doing your part. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, <laughs> this is, <laughs> nah, was corny as fuck. This it has really been a podcast <laughs> called Friends, Facts, and Fiction, and we out. Thanks for listening and stay tuned for the next installment. Find us on Facebook and Instagram to stay up to date on all things friends, facts, and fiction. Our Instagram handle is friends underscore facts underscore fiction. As always, please reach out to us. You can send any of your questions, praise, and fact checking to friends period facts period fiction at gmail.com. It's important to us to only propagate the truth and we'll correct any errors we may have made. Your hosts and researchers are Justin Hammonds, Grant Bramlett, and Drew Shelnut. Our episodes are produced by Grant Bramlett. Additional producership provided by Grace Higgs. Our recording engineer is Grant Bramlett. Our editor, mix, and mastering audio engineer is Jeremy Mulder. Lighting design is provided by Justin Hammond. This has been a production of Friends, Facts, and Fiction. We're trying to French kiss. Why? <laughs> <laughs> I was over here. So bad. Well, I thought was.